I love the visual in this song, dry bones rattling. What we thought was dead or is impossible coming to life through God's power. We invite you to stand and sing. Saturday was silent, surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty too. ever stopped you this is the sound of dry bones rattling this is the praise make a dead man walk again open the grave i'm coming out i'm gonna live gonna live again this is the sound of dry bones rattling know this, we hold on to hope, relentless, irrational hope that God's going to show up and he's going to do it again.
run to him and we bow before him. It was never God's purpose to abandon Jesus in that tomb, you see. His purpose was always to exalt Jesus, to exalt that name above every other name, so that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Amen and glory to God.
Christ is risen. Come on, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. You took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven. Oh, we're forgiven. Yes, we are. The work forever done, only by the blood, it is finished. God, we are so grateful to be able to come and to gather here once again in your name. And this day, especially, we are thankful that we gather not just as people, not just as your people, but as Easter people, confident and sure in the knowledge that Jesus is risen, that you did not leave him alone in that tomb, that despite our Friday and our Saturday when everything seems lost and we can't imagine how everything could ever be made right ever again, Sunday is coming, Easter is coming. You have the victory, the tomb is empty. You alone have the glory. Father, we just lift up our praise and our thanks to you this morning. All glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to the venue. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Shelby, and I serve as the Director of Discipleship here at Fuquay Verena United Methodist. And this is our worship service that is specifically crafted for community online. We are so glad you are here with us, joining us in worship this morning. Um, this morning we have Ron uh, with us online, and Bob is here in the room with us as well. If you are worshiping with us this morning, we would love to gift you a coffee mug so that you can drink your coffee at home while we drink our coffee here and worship together. And to get a mug, just text coffee to the number at the bottom of your screen, or you can go to favoomc.org slash venue. One of our kind of core hopes of this online worship service is that uh, it will not just be an online point of connection, but that will also help you connect with people in our community beyond this service. And so with that in mind, we have several announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, all great things. Um, so first is uh, we have a new members class that is coming up next Sunday, April 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. So if you um, haven't taken a new members class yet, if you want to learn more about um, kind of the church and who we are and get connected with some other folks who might be new to the church as well. Uh, we would love to see you there. You can register for that at favoomc.org slash new members. And that's next Sunday, April 14th. We have another uh, opportunity to um, kind of meet folks and learn more about our church uh, coming up the following Sunday, April 21st. 
uh, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. It is called Come Learn Some More. And yes, uh, you can drop your kids off. We have children's and youth programming that happens uh, at that exact same time. And so you could drop them off and then come out and join us on the patio uh, for s'mores uh, around the fire and um, for good conversation and opportunity to connect and learn more uh, about our church. And uh, another thing that we have coming up that we're really excited about is uh, our churchwide ice cream social at The Scoop. That is coming up on Sunday, May 19th from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, we did that for the first time last year, and it was a huge success, huge hit, so much fun. Um, that is uh, also the kickoff for our Summer Forks and Fellowship groups. Um, so if you are interested in those, um, it's a great way to get to know a few new friends this summer. Um, you can sign up to be in a Forks and Fellowship group. Um, groups, groups get together uh, once a month from June uh, to August. So June, July, and August for food and fellowship. Um, we also need people who are willing to coordinate these groups. Um, so if you might be willing to kind of head up one of those groups, and it's really just coordinating around getting together three times this summer for food and fellowship, there is a place uh, on the form to indicate uh, whether you'd be willing to serve as a group coordinator this summer. You can register for that at favumsi.org slash forks24. We have a couple more announcements this morning. Uh, so next are... Um, we're starting a new sermon series this morning on um, the Lord's Prayer, and to go along with that, we are offering a series of prayer workshops uh, where you are invited to come learn about and explore different types of prayer, ways of connecting with God through prayer. Um, so each of these workshops will be offered twice, uh, once on Wednesday evening uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. and once on Sunday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. And those workshops start this Wednesday. Um, they're standalone, so each one is focused on a different uh, type of prayer, and you can come to as many as you are able to, or you can come to all of them. Um, you can find out more details and sign up for those at favumc.org slash smallgroups24. And uh, believe it or not, VBS is quickly approaching us. So that's our Vacation Bible School uh, that is coming up at the end of June, June 24th to 27th. Um, the theme this year is diving into friendship with God. So it's like an under the sea theme, which is really fun. I think we just announced uh, the name of the VBS mascot, which is who's a sea turtle. Uh, this week, it's going to be Shelly. Um, and registration opens today for volunteers uh, for VBS. So register to volunteer and um, volunteers also get early bird registration for your kids. Um, so that is open as of today at favumc.org slash VBS24. Um, lastly, that was all about our kids, and we just also want to shout out our high school youth who are currently um, on a retreat together, uh, the high school retreat at Camp Don Lee, um, which is towards the coast. It is an awesome place, and we know that they are having a great weekend, but uh, would just love for you to lift them up in prayer um, as they kind of wrap up their time together uh, on retreat this morning. And... Then we have one more announcement this morning, uh, which is about Pastor Hope's position. Um, so Hope is going to share a little bit more about where she's headed next and what she's going to be doing. And then we will hear from our new associate pastor. And after that, we'll go straight into uh, worship and into our first song and the message. A few weeks ago, I announced that I would be leaving Favumsi this summer and that I'd have an announcement of where I was headed the Sunday after Easter, and today is that day. I'm excited to announce that I will be the Associate Director for Discernment and Development for the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Uh, this is a brand new position that's designed to recruit and support individuals that are discerning a call to ministry with a particular emphasis on recruiting and supporting BIPOC clergy and individuals that are excited about co-creating new spaces for new people. I'll be working with both the Office of New Faith Communities and the Office of Clergy Life to lead our conference in developing clergy that are called and equipped not only for the local church, but also for the future of the church as we continue to create new space for new people for the future of the United Methodist Church in North Carolina. I'm so grateful for your prayers in the midst of this season of transition. We'll have more info to come about my last Sunday here, as well as the first Sunday that our new associate is coming. 
And speaking of, I know that you all are really excited to hear uh, who's coming. And we have a quick video of a Zoom call that Owen and I had with the new associate that is coming about a week or so ago. And we'd love for you to have the chance to get to meet her. Well, everybody, we're uh, so delighted to be joined by Melanie Sebastian Stafford today, uh, who is making plans to come and be uh, among us in ministry as one of our pastors. Uh, so, Melanie, welcome, <laughs> welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. I am so excited to join you all in ministry. Uh, my name is Melanie. I grew up in Northwest Florida, born in the Philippines, went to seminary at Candler in Atlanta. I'm currently living in Southeast Alabama. I'm really excited to make the move to North Carolina. Yeah, so you're in Alabama now and coming to Fuquay. Can you share a little bit about why North Carolina, why Fuquay? Yeah, so I recently got married. Like, I think it's 21 days now as of this recording. So um, my uh, my current husband um, is a former military person and a lot of his found family, people he served with, live in North Carolina now. And so uh, when we got married, we made a big compromise that um, I would search for an appointment in North Carolina and his compromise was due to the appointment process anywhere in North Carolina. Um, and so we're really excited to end up in Pupe. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I think as we're recording this next week is honeymoon week. Yes, Greece. Yeah, awesome. <sighs> Live it up, enjoy that, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, the old, you know, Alabama to Fuquay pipeline in full effect there. Uh, maybe last question. Uh, you're moving to North Carolina. On one side, we have mountains and on the other side, we have beach. What would your choice be between mountains and beach? What's your preference? Uh, that's a tough call. I do love a good hike, but the reason we're going to Greece is that both my husband and I love the beach. And so it was a place where we could both be happy. Um, so probably beach, but I haven't spent much time on North Carolina beaches and that's much different than the Gulf I grew up on. So we'll see what it ends up being. Well, Melanie, uh, it's uh, been so much fun to get to know you over the last few weeks and all of the appointment process that we've been running through, but uh, we're really looking forward to having you here and among us. And uh, we know you'll be ready to hit the ground running and safe travels on your trip, as well as moving your whole entire life uh, to North Carolina. But we're, we're excited Just to have Just a few you. transitions all at once. Just a few. Jobs, moving states, getting married. Just do it all at once. <laughs> do it all at once. It's a Rip. nice job. Yeah. Rip the old Band-Aid off, yeah. Good deal. Well, thanks for taking time, uh, and we'll see you in person real soon. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true faith, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, hello, friends. Today we are kicking off a brand new sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. I'm so glad that you were with us for the series. It is going to be kind of kicking off today. We'll be walking through the Lord's Prayer for the next eight weeks or so. And this might be a prayer that's familiar to you. Maybe for some of us, it's a brand new prayer. And I'm going to go ahead and put the words up on the screen so that you can be kind of reading over them and either remembering this familiar prayer or kind of learning it for the first time. We will spend a lot of time praying through it a little bit later on. But first, I wanted to just kind of set up what the Lord's Prayer means to me. Uh, For me, it's the first prayer of any kind of length that I learned how to pray. I remember praying one line and then the next, uh, my parents would pray a line and then I would pray a line and my parents would pray another line. That was kind of the way that we memorized it together until I kind of felt comfortable enough praying all of the lines all together, both of my parents. And then I'd pray it on Sunday mornings at church and that sort of thing as well. Uh, Not only is this prayer one of the first prayers that many people learn how to pray, but it's often the last prayer on the lips of those who are dying. I regularly have the privilege of visiting church members who are in their last days. And every time that I go for a visit, I always conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Sometimes folks are alert enough to be able to mouth the words alongside me or even say them. Uh, Others aren't really able to get the words out. And yet I often find that as I'm praying, whether I'm holding their hand or just kind of watching their breath go up and down, that I can see them tangibly kind of relax into the words of these of this prayer as the kind of familiar words wash over them. There are so many stories that I could share about the Lord's Prayer, but there are two kind of particular instances of praying this prayer that have stood out to me that I want to kind of begin with. The first is less about a particular person and more about a phenomenon that I regularly experience. A lot of folks that we visit, even kind of before their last days, struggle with memory. And for many, it's a battle with dementia or Alzheimer's. For others, there are many contributing factors. But I'm always amazed when I go on these visits and I have kind of a circular conversation where the same question is asked and I give the same answer and then the question is asked again and we're just having this roundabout kind of circular conversation that just feels like we're, we're stuck in a moment and we, we don't know how to get out. And, and yet, when I ask if we can pray to close these visits, I'm always amazed at how this kind of scattered conversation turns to the person being kind of like dialed in and so focused as they perfectly recite all of the words of the Lord's Prayer. Because it's a prayer that this person has prayed probably all the days of their life. So it is far back in long-term memory, such that even when they can't remember anything else, they can remember the words of this prayer. Uh, The second instance that stands out to me was in the year 2020, a rough year for sure. Um, This instance was actually on Christmas Eve. So December 24th of 2020, um, we gathered as a pastor team and with a few lay folks who were helping us to serve communion. And if you were with us at this time, you might remember we had massive tents in the back of the church for drive-throughs. And on Christmas Eve, we set them up in the back so that you could kind of drive cars under them so that we could kind of stay out of the downpour that was actually like a record setting downpour on Christmas Eve. And folks would would drive through, we'd serve communion. And before we set out to serve everybody, we had a little meeting beforehand and served one another, which is something we hadn't done in a really long time. 
And I hadn't realized how much I had missed hearing other people's voices in worship until the moment that whoever it was that was kind of leading that moment invited us to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I just found myself kind of tearing up as I heard other people's voices kind of join in worship for the first time in nine months. Yes, I'd heard us kind of worshiping together. I'd been a part of leading worship online, but it just wasn't the same as in person hearing others pray the same prayer all together. As you will learn, this is uh, not only a personal prayer, but a prayer that is really meant to be prayed in community. And I certainly didn't realize how much I'd missed hearing the sound of other people's voices until that moment. Uh, prior to that moment, the last time that I had prayed the Lord's Prayer in community had been on March 13th, 2020. So this was in kind of the waning hours of shutdown, and it was uh, Doris Green's funeral. Some of you might remember Doris Green. She was a member of this church and was maybe a week or so before her funeral that I'd gathered with her kids and, and prayed and anointed Doris uh, with family members kind of gathered around. We, I anointed her with oil and somewhere between the anointing and the you know, last prayers and all of us praying together the Lord's Prayer, uh, somewhere in there, Doris took her last breath. Uh, it was a really holy moment, to say the least, to kind of usher her from this life to the next with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. It's for sure a moment that I will treasure, uh, realizing that it, something like that where someone has uh, passed right as we are there kind of praying over them. It's certainly something that hasn't happened since. Maybe it never will happen again quite like that, but it's a moment that I will always treasure and kind of hold on to. Hopefully, at this point, it's clear uh, that at least for me, this prayer has been significant. It's been a transformative prayer to pray throughout my life in different seasons. Maybe this is your story as well. Uh, if it has not yet been your story, my hope is that by the end of this series, you'll have a new or a renewed appreciation, uh, not just for the words of this prayer, but for what God might do in us as we study and pray these words for the next couple of months. If you've been with us at all for the last six weeks or so, you may know that we've been praying through the words of another prayer, uh, the words of the Shema. This is kind of a significant prayer in scripture. It's a Jewish prayer that Jesus and his disciples would have prayed at the very least every morning and every evening. And the opening words to the Shema say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. As for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, later, Jesus will go on to call these words the greatest commandment. And if you were with us on Monday, Thursday uh, of Holy Week, you may remember that we talked about this new commandment that Jesus gave his disciples. This commandment is pulled from the words of Leviticus, to love one another as I've loved you. In other places, Jesus translates this as to love our neighbors as ourselves, which is what Jesus comes to call the second greatest commandment. As we walk through the Lord's Prayer, I'd encourage you to see it as an extension of the Shema, because this prayer is in a sense a mirror of these greatest commandments that Jesus offers to love God and to love neighbor. And the first half of the Lord's Prayer invites us to more deeply love God. And the second half of the Lord's Prayer is all about loving our neighbors. So as we rehearse the words of the Lord's Prayer, my hope is that they will also help us to continue to live into the words of the Shema, patterning our lives after loving God with our full selves. As we talked about kind of the same way with the Shema, prayer would have been a way of life for Jesus and for his disciples. So it does feel kind of significant that Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them to pray as they already would have known tons of prayers, the Shema included. It seems even more significant to me that Jesus actually gives them a really specific answer. Uh, we see in Luke chapter 11, the specific ask from the disciples of Jesus. We'll start in verse one. It says, he was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, and then the prayer that follows is the Lord's prayer. I have to believe that the disciples saw something different in Jesus when he prayed or how he understood prayer or they would not have asked him the question in this way. Maybe they saw that Jesus understood prayer to be of, kind of utmost importance. Perhaps they saw him recognizing prayer as the source of his power. Maybe they'd heard snippets of Jesus's prayers to God, and they were curious as to how they could pray accordingly. I don't, I don't know exactly what it was that caused them to ask this question. 
but my hope is that throughout the series that our own prayer lives will continue to be awakened or renewed. I've heard so many of you name that praying the Shema or hearing sermons and stories from people in our congregation as we walked through the Shema the last kind of six weeks or so, that that's transformed your own prayer life or even the questions that you've been asking of God. And my hope is that as we continue to lean into the season of prayer, that we might inhabit these words and that our lives may continue to be shaped and formed to be more like Jesus. Earlier, I mentioned that the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And there's a similar passage in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is kind of in the midst of a section of teaching his disciples a whole lot about prayer. And then in the middle of that, we find the Lord's Prayer. And in this gospel, I'm really struck by kind of the verse and a half coming right before the Lord's Prayer, where it says, Your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then in this way. Uh, one reading of this verse could be, God already knows what I need, so there's no sense in praying or asking. Another reading of this could be, God already knows what you need. Everything you need can now be found in this prayer that follows. Um, like many people, I grew up asking the question, well, why should I pray? if God already knows our needs before we ask. I knew that we didn't pray to inform God of things because God already knows all things. I knew that we didn't pray as if God was some kind of holy vending machine granting random asks for designer jeans or popularity or whatever it is that we wanted. I did know that we often prayed when we were scared or afraid. In fact, I remember the very first time that my sister got behind the wheel of a car. I remember it because for some reason I was there. I don't know why that happened, but here we are. It was at the SAS soccer fields, and we both grew up playing soccer, and it was one afternoon where the fields had cleared out and the parking lot was empty, and it was kind of my sister and dad in the front seat, and our good friend Ramon and me were kind of hanging out in the back seat. Anyway, I started, or all of this started by my sister asking the question if she could put stickers on uh, the gas pedal and the brake pedal like they do on go-karts, where one is green and one is red, so that she could remember which one was which. So again, we had a right to be anxious in this moment. And then she just kind of takes the car and puts it in reverse. And at that moment, I'll never forget Ramon, who was sitting next to me, just kind of breaks into reciting the Lord's Prayer again and again, like, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like, he keeps praying that until we go around the parking lot and then she safely puts the car back into park and we can get out of the car. And I'm pretty sure Ramon actually jumped out and like kissed the ground. He was so happy. To this day, I still generally refuse to ride with my sister for fear of my life. So all of that was for sure warranted. Um, she's gotten better for sure, but it's, it's still a rough time. Anyway, sometimes we pray in general or specifically these words because it's all we can do in a moment of fear or anxiety. Uh, on a more serious note though, I don't know that I could have named it then, but as I look back on my earliest memories of praying kind of earnestly in high school, my prayer life was heavily shaped by three particularly uh, difficult tragedies. The first was the death of a child in our congregation to a brain tumor. The second was the tragedy of a peer in my youth group being paralyzed from the neck down on a mission trip that I was on. And the third was a miracle of a friend from school surviving a near-death experience from a liver failure and then a subsequent liver transplant that followed, which saved her life. These experiences at an early age, kind of because of them, I learned firsthand that prayer is about expressing our heart and our deepest longings to God. The prayer is about drawing near to God in our everyday. As I spent many restless nights with friends and our youth group, kind of crying out to God in prayer, I learned that the words that we pray shape and form not only our hearts, but also our very lives. I found many times throughout these experiences that sometimes we come to the end of our words and there simply are no more words to pray. Sometimes familiar prayers like the Lord's Prayer kind of seep out when we don't know what else to say. As a pastor now, my hope is that these words of the Lord's Prayer can be a trellis for each and every one of us. They can be words that kind of teach us to pray daily, that shape and form us, a prayer that trains us to offer our greatest hopes and our deepest fears to God. My hope is that the words of this prayer give us words to say when we come up against the limits of being human, when we don't know what else to say or to pray. So over the next eight weeks, we'll be walking through this prayer, a line by line, sometimes even word by word. My invitation for each of us 
is that we would rehearse the words of this prayer over the next uh, eight weeks. I'm going to make it my goal to pray this prayer three times a day throughout the series. And I'd love if you want to join me. And of course, there are many different ways that you can join in this invitation, but I'll offer three options that might work best for you. The first is that you can pray the traditional three times of day that the Lord's Prayer was prayed by early Christians, which is at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. If you choose to go this route, I encourage you maybe set an alarm for these times. Uh, speaking of, there is my own alarm, uh, so that you can pray it and remember the words of this prayer. Uh, second, you could pray the Lord's Prayer at your three meals throughout the day. Uh, maybe blessings at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Or lastly, maybe you think through kind of what works for you, what works for your own life and your own schedule, and just pick three times throughout the day that work for you to pause and to pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, one last note, though, is that I recognize that there are many of you uh, that worship with us regularly that have had difficult or maybe even traumatic experiences with the church, and prayers like this may conjure up kind of difficult memories for you. And if this is you, I'd encourage you to give yourself lots of grace during this series of recognizing that it might take time to see this prayer through a new kind of lens. Um, friends, I'm going to invite us to close in prayer, and then we'll close out with the words of the Lord's Prayer. And wherever you're worshiping with us from today, I'd encourage you to pray the prayer uh, with us. Let's pray. Holy God, you are a God that meets us in the midst of our prayer that no matter where we are or what we are going through, that you hear us when we pray. Lord, so often uh, we have questions for you and all throughout scripture where we see regularly you answering a question with a question. And yet when the disciples ask you how to pray, not only did you give them the words to pray, but you gave them the Lord's prayer, this very specific kind of prayer so that we might remember any time we pray this prayer, that we can meet you and that our lives might be patterned and shaped and formed after this prayer that reminds us uh, to love you and to also, by extension, love our neighbors as ourselves. So God, we offer uh, the fullness of who we are to you as we pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I just love uh, the idea of the Lord's Prayer as a trellis. Um, I was listening to Pastor Hope's sermon here with you all for the first time, and that word really jumped out at me. Um, just the idea of the Lord's Prayer as a trellis, something that we can kind of cling to, something that can um, support us and train us um, as we learn to pray, as we learn to offer uh, our deepest longings um, to God, and um, as we ask God to teach us to pray, just like the disciples asked Jesus, um, teach us to pray. Um, I know for me, the Lord's Prayer uh, is something that I'll often pray, uh, like when I'm in bed falling asleep at night, if I can't fall asleep, especially that prayer, uh, it just will repeat it over and over again and let the words wash over me and settle me into sleep. Um, maybe you have a particular time or um, place that, that you pray the Lord's Prayer as well. Um, but I hope uh, that you will join us in uh, Hope's Challenge um, during this season to choose three times of day to pray uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, and in addition to praying the Lord's Prayer uh, kind of three times a day, maybe taking on that challenge, um, I mentioned the prayer workshops earlier, but um, would just lift those up again as an opportunity. Uh, again, those can be a kind of trellis as well, um, ways to uh, come and learn more about and explore um, different types of prayer, ways of connecting with God um, and offering your deepest longings to God. Um, so those start this week. The first workshop is this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the Centrum. And um, that workshop, that first workshop is on Lectio Divina. Um, that is an ancient way of praying with scripture 
in this sort of meditative, reflective way, um, slowing down to listen for the word or phrase that stands out to you and why. Um, so allowing the Holy Spirit uh, to bring something particular to your attention, just like I think the Holy Spirit um, brought the word trellis to my attention this morning um, as Hope was uh, sharing her message. So I uh, would encourage you to come on out to that. Um, again, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the Centrum. Uh, it'll also be offered that same workshop again at 9 a.m. on Sunday in the chapel. Um, so this will be these workshops will be a great way um, to connect not only with God, but also with other people uh, who are, um, none of us are prayer experts, right? But we're all just seeking to learn uh, new ways um, to explore prayer and to connect with God through prayer. So there's more info about those, and you can sign up for those at favumc.org slash smallgroups24. And um, today in worship across all of our sort of in-person services, we are sharing in communion together as we do every first Sunday. Um, so if you uh, would like to have communion delivered to you um, or you'd like to come to the office to receive communion later this week, uh, we would love to um, make that happen. So you can text or call the number on the screen and we will set aside communion from the table this week um, just for you. Uh, again, that we can deliver to you at your home uh, or you can come to the office and pick up. And now I would um, invite us to continue in a prayerful posture as we um, worship together and sing our closing song. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great Well, friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad to have you here uh, at the venue. And uh, just a reminder that if you uh, would like a coffee mug, uh, just feel free to text coffee to the number on the screen, and we would love to gift you with one of those. Um, and also a reminder that um, if you haven't participated in a new members class before and you're interested in learning more, um, we have our next new members class coming up next Sunday, um, April 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. And finally, the following Sunday, um, again, an opportunity to come and uh, connect with our pastors and some other um, leaders and just learn more, ask any questions that you have about the church. Um, that's come learn some more um, on the patio 
uh, April 21st um, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. So you can drop your kids off or your youth off and then come on out to the patio and learn some more. And as we um, go out into all of the places that we live, work, and play this week, um, I'm just excited to see uh, what God does in us uh, as we learn to be a prayerful people together. Um, and so, again, I would encourage and challenge you um, to consider what it would look like uh, for you to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day um, this week. I know um, I'm going to take up that challenge, and I invite you to join me and see uh, what God does in us through the Lord's Prayer this week. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you back here next week on the venue. Go in peace. So I am 
I'm super excited to announce I'll be the Associate Director for New Faith Communities. Seal the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, your Give myself to you. 
This morning, we invite you to consider what it would look like to answer God's call to walk out of the darkness and into his amazing light. Sing with us. In the dark and all alone, growing comfortable, are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believe, safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found. You're just asleep, and it's time to leave. Come on and rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus, your friend? You, the power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Rise up, rise up, out from the grave like Lazarus. When he said your name, the thing that filled your veins was more than blood, so kind of love that washes sin away. Now the door is open wide, and the stone's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has grown, so come on and rise up. Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus, your brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus, like Lazarus, rise up. Out from the grave like Lazarus, he's calling us to walk out of the dark, and he's given us new resurrected hearts. Oh, he's calling us to walk out of the dark. He's giving us new resurrected heart. Oh, oh, oh. Come on and rise up. Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus, your brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus. that Jesus is as close to us right now as the whisper of his name. So I encourage you to do that, to whisper his name in the space where you're seated. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. Restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our eyes. So we pour out a praise. We pour out a praise. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lives. 
Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. This next song, uh, The Father's House, reminds me of the story of the prodigal son and how we have this amazing, loving father who is always ready to rejoice when we, when we return back to him. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failed to want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Failure want to find me, cause that's what my father does. journey is where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. No failure's never final. Good morning. My name is Jenna. I'm one of the worship leaders here. We invite you to stand as you are able to, as we step into this space that we call worship. Let's come with the highest of praise for our Lord. Let's sing together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart.
My name is Hope. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is so good to be together this morning. Uh, we do have our kids in praise that are going to be calling us to worship, but just a couple notes before that. Uh, we do have cookies and visitor bags that are at the white tent on your way out of worship. You can just grab them. They're right past the fountain. If you are new with us, feel free to grab those. And in the chair pocket right in front of you, there's a Connect Serve card, and you can fill that out and drop it in the offering box if you are wanting to get on email lists or connect with us in any way. And lastly, we do have a new members class coming up in one week from now. Uh, so you can register online at bumc.org slash new members. You also can see all the upcoming dates for membership if that's something that you are, have been worshiping with us and are interested in what it might look like to join the church or just want to meet some other people that are also new and ask some questions about our church family. We'd love the chance to get to see you at that class. All right, kids and praise, are you ready to call us to worship? All right. Amen. How beautiful to be led in worship by our children. We invite you to stand as you are able, as we get comfortable in this space that we call worship, as we come knowing what we experienced last week, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come today as Easter people, knowing that death never has the final word, no matter the disappointment, no matter the struggle, not even death, our God can overcome it. Our God can transform it. Let's worship that way this morning. See the tomb where he laid. See the stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars. Hey.
him alone we watch and wait like a bride for a groom old church arise he's coming soon yes almighty god almighty god we come before you remembering the things that we experienced last week the way that we witnessed the death and the resurrection of our lord jesus christ and so we come holding on to that great love. We come knowing that you are a transformative God, a God that can take anything that we face and transform it for your good, even death. And so we cling to that. Almighty God, we thank you and we love you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again, friends. If you uh, slipped in after we had a chance to greet you, my name is Hope. I serve as one of the pastors here. It's good to be in worship together. Uh, when you came in this morning, you should have gotten a handout. It has lots of things that are coming up in the life of our church family. So just wanted to highlight a couple things first before we jump into the sermon this morning. Uh, you'll see at the top of the handout, it says, Come Learn Some More. This is an event we have coming up in just two weeks. And Owen and I will be hanging out on the hospitality patio, making s'mores, and feel free to drop by, ask a question or two, and you're welcome to stick around for as long as you want. Uh, this is during kids and youth programming, so if you are dropping off kids for small groups or youth for youth group, feel free to drop them off and then come make a s'more or two and hang out, ask some questions. Also, we are headed to The Scoop on May 19th. Uh, that is a church-wide event. We all are headed there to kick off the summer. We love the chance to get to see you there. Uh, there also is an opportunity. I don't think we have a slide for it, but it's the bottom of the handout for Forks and Fellowship signups. That will be happening now through May 19th. So if you are wanting to meet some folks in a small group, go to dinner about once a month throughout the summer, then Forks and Fellowship is the perfect opportunity to get to meet some people and build some community. So you can go to fumc.org slash forks24 to sign up for that. And on the back of your handout, you'll see information about prayer workshops, and those are kicking off actually this Wednesday. Um, we have a Lectio Divina both this Wednesday and this coming Sunday, uh, led by Deb Murphy, and we'll have new workshops like that every single week. We have the whole list of them on the website, so you can go ahead and sign up for any or all of the workshops you'd like to go to. They all are, are one-off, and they're the exact same on Wednesday as they are on Sunday morning. And lastly, VBS registration for volunteers is live, so feel free to, if you are planning to volunteer at VBS this summer, you are welcome to register and register your kids as well, and registration for everybody else is coming very, very soon, so excited for that, and would love to be able to connect y'all to VBS happening this summer. Well, this morning, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series all about the Lord's Prayer. And this is something that we're going to be in for the next, like, eight weeks or so. And I don't know if the Lord's Prayer is familiar to you. Maybe you learned it growing up. Maybe um, you know it because we've prayed it in this worship service regularly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the words up on the screen so we can be reading over them. I know that it is a little bit small, but hopefully you can at least see them, familiarize yourself with these words. Um, hopefully they are words that you have heard at some point throughout your life, uh, whether you have been in church for a very long time or even have just started coming. Um, we will have a chance to pray these words in a little bit at the end of our communion liturgy. Uh, but first, I wanted to take a chance to share a little bit about what the Lord's Prayer has meant to me and what I hope it might mean for you as well, um, either throughout the series or not. So the Lord's Prayer is the first prayer that I learned to pray as a kid. I remember my parents used the method of like, I would pray one line, and then they would pray the next line, and then I would pray the next, and then they would pray until I felt comfortable enough or confident enough to pray all of the lines of the prayer uh, together with them. So we would pray it every night before bed, and I also would pray it, you know, every Sunday in worship and was so proud that this prayer that my parents and I prayed together was also one that I got to pray in worship every Sunday. 
Not only is this often one of the very first prayers that people learn, but it's often also uh, one of the last prayers on the lips of folks who are dying. Um, I regularly have the privilege of visiting church members who are in their last days, and every time that I go for a visit, I always like to conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Um, Sometimes at this point, people are uh, still learnt enough to be able to mouth the words or even kind of say them along with me. Um, Other times, folks are not able to, and even though they can't get the words out or even mouth them at that point, I often recognize that as uh, me and their family members kind of pray the words of the Lord's Prayer over them, that you can kind of see them relax into that moment as familiar words wash over them. There are so many stories that I could share about the Lord's Prayer, but there are two particular instances of praying this prayer uh, that have kind of stood out to me as I've been thinking about this series. And the first is less about a particular particular phenomenon, more about, um, or less about a particular person, but more about a phenomenon, sorry. Um, A lot of folks that we do visit, even before their last days, uh, struggle with memory And for some, this is a battle with dementia or Alzheimer's. For others, it is kind of a combination of factors. But I'm always amazed in these kinds of visits where I have had the same conversation kind of circularly about six or seven times where the same question is asked, give the same answer, and then, oh, we're going to do this again. Okay, yep, let's, let's have the same conversation. And we just kind of get caught in a loop where we're having the same conversation again and again, or it just kind of feels a little bit scattered. And it's just clear in those moments that memory is difficult. It's not as sharp as maybe it used to be. Um, and yet, I'm always amazed when, before I leave, I ask if I can pray uh, together with them. And this kind of scattered conversation turns to laser focus as this person prays the Lord's Prayer with me and kind of perfectly, by memory, just absolutely nailing it. And I realize, for most folks, that's because this is a prayer that they have prayed so often throughout their life that it is way back in long-term memory, such that when they cannot remember most things about life anymore, they can still kind of hold on to these familiar words of the Lord's Prayer. And it's always my hope that I will be able to, to do the same, that it's such a prayer that has been internalized for me, that even if um, down the road my memory goes, that I still will be able to hang on to these words. Uh, the second instance happened in the year 2020, our uh, favorite year to look back on and reflect. <laughs> but this was in December, uh, December 24th, so Christmas Eve of 2020. Uh, and there was a group of us that gathered just actually right behind me outside in the parking lot as we prepared to serve drive through communion for Christmas Eve. If you were with us back in 2020, you might remember that we had these massive tents that we used during that drive through so people could drive through and we could serve communion. And on that day, it happened to be a record-setting downpour, so we were extra grateful for those tents. I think I had, like, rain boots on that were up to my knees because it really it was crazy rain. Um, And yet, there was a really holy moment before we kind of started serving drive-through communion, where the team of us that had gathered to pray, uh, or gathered to serve, we gathered together first to be able to pray and kind of prepare for communion. And whoever was kind of leading that moment, I don't actually remember who it was, invited all of us to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I had not realized until that moment how much I had missed hearing other people's voices in the midst of worship. Like, we'd been worshiping online together, all praying the Lord's Prayer from our own homes, but until this moment when I heard people praying these familiar words alongside me, um, I just found myself having tears kind of stream down my face as it was just such a special and kind of long-awaited moment. Uh, Prior to that moment, the last time that I'd prayed the words of the Lord's Prayer in community had been on March 13th, 2020. So it was in the waning hours of the shutdown. We had had two funerals that week. You might remember there was one on Wednesday and one was on Friday. This was the Friday one. And it was Doris Green's funeral, a member of our church community. And about a week or so before that funeral, I had gathered with her and her family uh, to anoint Doris and to pray over her in kind of the last uh, little bit of her life. And I distinctly remember this moment because somewhere between anointing her and praying the Lord's Prayer together, uh, we realized that Doris had taken her last breath. And it was just a exceptionally holy moment and that we got to kind of pray over her and usher her uh, from this life into the next with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. 
Um, for me, it for sure is a moment that I have treasured, uh, knowing that maybe something like that will never happen again quite like that. It certainly has not happened since, and just how holy of a moment that was. Hopefully, at this point, it is clear that this has been a significant and transformative prayer in my own life, and my hope is that it also has been or will be a significant prayer for you. If it has not yet been, my hope is that by the end of the series, you'll have either a new or a renewed appreciation, and not just for the words of this prayer, but also for what God might do in us as we pray and study these words over the next couple of months. If you have been with us throughout Lent, kind of the last six or seven weeks or so, you may know that we have been praying the words of a different prayer, the words of the Shema, which is another significant prayer in Scripture. This is a Jewish prayer that they would have prayed every morning and every evening, Jesus and his disciples. The opening words of the Shema say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We spent a lot of time kind of unpacking the words of the Shema. But Jesus later calls these words the greatest commandment. If you were with us on Monday, Thursday, you may remember that we talked about this new commandment that Jesus gives his disciples on that day. And I pulled from the words of Leviticus, it's a command to love one another as I have loved you. In other places in scripture, this is written as um, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this is what Jesus calls the second greatest commandment. So these two greatest commandments held together invite us to love God, to love our neighbors. And as we walk through the Lord's Prayer, I'd encourage you to see it actually as an extension of the, the Shema. Because this prayer, in a sense, is a mirror of these two greatest commandments that Jesus offers. I think we have a slide that shows the first um, little bit of the prayer, kind of the three bolded lines at the top, are all about love of God. And then the rest of the prayer is all about loving our neighbors. So it invites us to live into these two greatest commandments. My hope is that as we rehearse the words of Lord's Prayer, they may help us to continue to live into these words of the Shema, patterning our lives after loving God with our whole selves. As we talked about with the Shema, prayer would have been just a way of life for Jesus and his disciples. Not only would they have prayed the Shema regularly every morning and every evening, but prayer in general was a way of life. There would have been a prayer or a blessing for nearly everything. They would have learned all of these at a very young age. So it feels really significant when we come to our scripture today that Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them to pray when they would have already known a lot of different prayers. Uh, it also seems significant to me that Jesus actually gives them a really specific answer. Often he answers their questions with a question, but this time he doesn't do that. He gives them a really specific answer. So we see in Luke chapter 11, this answer that he kind of gives to the disciples. It's set up first by saying that Jesus was praying in a certain place, and that after he had finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, and then what follows is the words of the Lord's Prayer. Now, I have to believe that the disciples saw something different in Jesus when he prayed, or maybe how they saw Jesus understand prayer, or they would not have asked him this question. They would have just already felt like, oh, we know the answer to that. I wonder, like, perhaps they saw that Jesus understood prayer as utmost important. Uh, maybe they saw Jesus recognizing prayer as the source of his power. Or maybe they heard Jesus praying to God, and they heard something different uh, than in how Jesus prayed than how they were praying, and they wanted to know kind of how can we replicate that in our own prayer lives. I'm really not sure. But my hope is um, that we can use these words that Jesus gave his disciples that we regularly use to teach us uh, to learn how to pray um, so that our prayer lives can also be kind of newly awakened or renewed. I've heard so many of you name that even praying the words of the Shema or hearing sermons or stories from people in our community over the last six or seven weeks, um, that, that has been really transformative in your own prayer life and even kind of the questions that you are asking of God. My hope is that as we continue to kind of lean into this season where we are praying in lots of different ways, that as we inhabit these words, um, we can be shaped and formed by them and therefore shaped and formed to be more like Jesus as well. 
Earlier, I mentioned uh, the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. I also want to look at a similar passage in Matthew, where Jesus is teaching his disciples a lot about prayer. And then kind of in the middle of his teaching on prayer, we find the words of the Lord's Prayer. In this Gospel, I'm struck by kind of like the verse and a half just before the Lord's Prayer. It says, Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray in this way, or pray then in this way. I think this is a really striking way to set up the Lord's Prayer, that the Father knows your needs before asking. And I found myself wondering, like, why is that included right before uh, the Lord's Prayer? I wonder if this can be interpreted, like, God already knows what I need, so maybe there's no sense in asking or praying. Uh, Another reading of this um, is that God already knows what you need, and everything that you need can be found in this prayer. And that interpretation of it makes a little bit more sense to me. Uh, like many people, I grew up asking a similar question to this, like, why Why should we pray? And what does it mean when we pray? Um, I knew from a young age that we didn't pray to inform God of things that God kind of already knows all. I also knew that we didn't pray as if God was some kind of holy vending machine where we ask for prayers for designer jeans or popularity or whatever it is that we wanted, and then God is just like, okay, yep, here you go. Um, Realized that was not how it worked. I also um, did know, even though I didn't know that it was other things, I did know that we often prayed when we found ourselves to be scared or afraid. I have a distinct memory of a time when um, I was praying because I was scared or afraid. There are a lot of stories, but this one really stands out to me. It was the first time that my sister got behind the wheel of a car, and (laughs) I don't really know why I was there. Like, I I do have some questions as to, like, my dad could have just done this with my sister, or my mom and my sister. Like, why did I need to be in the car? Anyway, it was at the SAS soccer fields right after some soccer games. So my sister and I had been playing, and we had wrapped that up for the day. The parking lot was clear, and I guess for some reason my dad thought, this is going to be the perfect time for Becca to practice driving. So we... Our, we have Becca and my dad in the front seat, and then me and our family friend Ramon are in the back seat. And the whole situation started out by my sister sitting in the driver's seat asking, do you think I can label the gas pedal and the brake like they do with go-karts with a red sticker and a green sticker so that I can just remember which one is which? <laughs> and so we had a right to be anxious. It was a little bit of a rough situation. Um, so that's the preface to it. And so she puts the car in reverse. And as soon as she does so, Ramon, who is sitting next to me, just breaks out into the Lord's Prayer. He's like, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Like, he just keeps praying it until she, like, safely puts the car back in park, and we are done with her driving. And I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty confident that when she put the car back in park, that Ramon jumped out of the car and kissed the ground and was like, I am not doing that again. (laughs) Again, sometimes we find ourselves praying because we are scared, because we are afraid or anxious, whatever it is. Um, On a more serious note, I don't know that I could have named it then, but as I look back in my earliest moments of praying, uh, particularly in high school, my prayer life was heavily shaped by three particular um, tragedies. Uh, The first was the death of a child in our congregation uh, to a brain tumor. Uh, The second was a tragedy of a peer on a mission trip that I was on. Uh, He was paralyzed from the neck down. And the third one was actually a miracle of a friend from school who survived a near-death experience and needed a life-saving liver transplant. And she lived um, from that kind of miraculously. So throughout all of these experiences at an early age, I learned firsthand that prayer is about expressing our heart and our deepest longings to God. The prayer is about drawing near to God in our everyday lives. As I spent many restless nights with friends in our youth group kind of crying out to God in prayer, I learned that the words that we pray shape us and form us. Not only do they shape and form our hearts, but they also shape and form our lives. I found many times throughout those difficult experiences that sometimes we come to the end of our words and there simply are no more words to pray. So sometimes words like the Lord's Prayer, familiar words, um, can seep out in these moments when we really don't know what else to say and so we pray what is familiar. As a pastor now, um, my hope is that these words of the Lord's Prayer 
can kind of be a trellis of sorts for each and every one of us. They can be words that teach us to pray daily, words that shape us, inform us, a prayer that trains us to offer both our greatest hopes and our deepest fears to God. My hope is that the words of this prayer gives us words when we come up against the limits of being human and we really don't know what else to say or what else to pray, but we can pray in the way that Jesus taught us. So over the next eight weeks or so, we'll be walking through this prayer, and my invitation to each of us is that we would rehearse the words of this prayer uh, over the next two months. I'm going to make it my goal to pray this prayer three times a day throughout this series. Uh, I'd love if you wanted to join me in that. Of course, there are a lot of different ways that you could join in this endeavor. Uh, There are kind of three options that may be helpful to think through of what works best for you and your schedule. The first is that we can pray at the three traditional times of day uh, that the disciples, or sorry, the early Christians would have prayed the Lord's Prayer. So this would have been at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. And if you choose to go this route, I am an alarms person. If I don't have an alarm for something, I'm not going to remember to do it. So I'd encourage you to set maybe an alarm on your phone for recurring uh, every day to be able to pray it at these three times. Uh, The second option is you could pray the Lord's Prayer at your kind of three meal times throughout the day. So as maybe your blessing for your meal at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. And lastly, if you feel like those first two don't really work for you or your schedule, I'd encourage you to think about, is there a trigger or something every day that you're going to think, okay, every time I get in the car, I can pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Or every time I go to take my dog on a walk, I can go and pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Kind of three set-aside times or distinct moments for you throughout your day that you can think about how you can be rehearsing these words. Um, Each week during the series, we will be praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Today, uh, it is a communion Sunday, so after we have a chance to um, rehearse and remember the words of our communion liturgy, then we will have a chance to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Um, Before we pray, though, I think it is helpful to always remember that when we come around this table We do come in a posture ready to rehearse and to remember. We come leaning on ancient words that have been passed down uh, for Christians for many generations. Uh, We remember the meal that we came around last week on Monday, Thursday, where Jesus uh, took bread and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we come offering ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. I'm going to invite you to open your hands as we continue in a posture of prayer. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, we feast at last at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, both now and forever. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to collectively say uh, the words of the Lord's Prayer, uh, may we pray the words of this prayer in a new way, uh, ready for these words to shape us and to form us so that we might be a people that live more and more every day in the way of Jesus. Let us rehearse and remember the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and invite those who are serving communion to come forward. 
as they do if you are new to serving or new to having communion with us. Um, we serve through what's called intinction. So we have ushers that will direct you to the nearest communion station if you would like to come forward and receive. And they'll have a piece of bread that's ripped off and given to you with the words, this is the body of Christ given for you. And then you are invited to dip the bread into the cup of grape juice and then receive both elements at the same time. And when you come forward, if you need prepackaged or gluten-free communion at every station, the bread person on our arm, we will have both prepackaged as well as gluten-free prepackaged communion. So just feel free to point to that or ask us for it. We'd love to give it to you. And we also have Arlene in the back who has the gluten-free only station that has an ingredient card. And so feel free to head to her um, back by the lobby if you would like to receive communion back there. As we come, one last note, if you need to receive communion at your seat, just let the ushers know. We'd be more than happy to bring communion to you. Friends, this is not our table, but this is the Lord's table, and all are welcome here. So let us come and feast together.
walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. start, John. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is John Clark. I'm the chair of the SBRC here at Favumsi, uh, and it is an honor and responsibility to uh, bring you up to speed on some pastoral changes that are happening uh, here at the church. I think it's good and, and important to note how this works. Uh, the, our, our church, Favumsi, is part of the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Uh, our bishop, Connie Sheldon, oversees the placements of clergies and appointments within our conference. Uh, and we're part of a district, and our district superintendent, Sonny Lim, has been working with the SBRC, with the church, on the upcoming transitions that are happening. Um, and first, uh, a couple weeks ago, we sent out a note, we made some announcements that a pastoral change was in the works, that Hope was going to be reappointed elsewhere, and, and we would be uh, uh, receiving a new associate pastor. Uh, so we're here today to provide you an update on what's going on. So 
I'll yes. invite Hope to tell us what she's going to be doing uh, in, the, in the future. That sounds great. Thank you, John. So I will actually be working at the conference office at the conference, North Carolina Conference for the United Methodist Church uh, that is located in Garner. And my title will be the Associate Director for New Faith Communities and Clergy Life for the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. So this is a brand new position designed to identify and equip individuals who are discerning a call to ministry with a particular emphasis on identifying and equipping BIPOC clergy and individuals who are excited about finding ways to co-create new spaces for new people. So I will be working with both the Office of New Faith Communities as well as the Office of Clergy Life to lead our conference in developing clergy that are called and equipped not only for the local church but also for the future of the United Methodist Church, particularly in North Carolina. So very excited for what's to come. V very excited and uh, and super sad to it, leave. It, we it, know it's, this. <laughs> it's okay to be sad. Like it, we, we it's okay to be sad and excited at the same time. And yes, and we are. For sure. uh, I was joking with Hope earlier in the week. It's kind of like we're not happy you're, le you're leaving. You understand that, right? But we're really excited <laughs> for where you're going. And it's a new so, opportunity. I, I hope you caught that. It is a new position within the conference that uh, Hope will be responsible for really setting up. So it's yeah, really good really and excited. it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and Hope is, is with us uh, into June uh, through March, uh, going to be through March, through May, May. excuse me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> into June, so uh, there's some celebrations that are be planning. So we're going to celebrate. Mm -hmm. We're going to celebrate Hope, her ministry. We're going to celebrate with her. Uh, so mm -hmm. stay tuned for that. There's some more details coming uh, beyond that. Uh, secondly, uh, we uh, Fabunsi have uh, been appointed a new pastor, a new associate pastor. Um, she will be joining us in July. July 7th actually will be her first day with us. Um, her name. Uh, she is Pastor Melanie Sebastian Stafford. Um, and she is currently serving as associate pastor at First Ozark United Methodist Church in Alabama. Um, she's, uh, yes. we, we obviously, we've talked with her. Uh, she, she's pretty incredible. It's going to be a, a great fit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she's in Alabama. She's not in Fuquay today uh, or even in North Carolina. Uh, but uh, Owen and Hope uh, had a chance to talk with her earlier this week, recorded a video, asked her a few questions so you can get to uh, know her. Uh, and so with that, we'll play the video. But I invite you uh, to introduce you. Uh, to Pastor Melanie. That sounds great. <laughs> well, everybody, we're uh, so delighted to be joined by Melanie Sebastian Stafford today, uh, who is making plans to come and be uh, among us in ministry as one of our pastors. Uh, so, Melanie, welcome, <laughs> welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. I am so excited to join you all in ministry. Uh, my name is Melanie. I grew up in Northwest Florida, born in the Philippines, went to seminary at Candler in Atlanta. I'm currently living in Southeast Alabama. I'm really excited to make the move to North Carolina. Yeah, so you're in Alabama now and coming to Fuquay. Can you share a little bit about why North Carolina, why Fuquay? Yeah, so I recently got married. Like, I think it's 21 days now as of this recording. So um, my, uh, my current husband um, is a former military person and a lot of his found family, people he served with, live in North Carolina now and so uh, when we got married, we made a big compromise that um, I would search for an appointment in North Carolina and his compromise was due to the appointment process anywhere in North Carolina. Um, and so we're really excited to end up in Pupe. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I think as we're recording this next week is honeymoon week. Yes, Greece. Yeah, awesome. <sighs> Live it up. Enjoy that. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, the old, you know, Alabama to Fuquay pipeline in full effect there. Uh, maybe last question. Uh, you're moving to North Carolina. On one side, we have mountains and on the other side, we have beach. What would your choice be between mountains and beach? What's your preference? Uh, that's a tough call. I do love a good hike, but the reason we're going to Greece is that both my husband and I love the beach. And so it was a place where we could both be happy. Um, so probably beach, but I haven't spent much time on North Carolina beaches and that's much different than the Gulf I grew up on. So we'll see what it ends up being. 
Mm-hmm. Well, Melanie, uh, it's uh, been so much fun to get to know you over the last few weeks and all of the appointment process that we've been running through, but uh, we're really looking forward to having you here and among us. And uh, we know you'll be ready to hit the ground running and safe travels on your trip, as well as moving your whole entire life uh, to North Carolina. But we're we're excited. Just to have a few you. transitions all at once. <laughs> Just a few. Jobs, moving states, getting married. Just do it all at once. Do it all at once. Rip the old band-aid off. Yeah. Good deal. Well, thanks for taking time, uh, and we'll see you in person real soon. Well, as Thank John you. mentioned, you she will be joining us at the beginning of July, so I know you will be anxious to hear about her and meet her when she gets here. Uh, I'm, as we prepare for the benediction, I'm going to invite us to stand up. Friends, as we head out from here, May we go as a prayerful people, rehearsing and remembering that the words that Jesus taught us to pray, may those words shape us and form us to be more like Jesus every day. You go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, friends, and we will see you next week.
Well, good morning, friends. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you, Diana, for ushering us into worship so well this morning. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to worship. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Hope. I serve as one of the pastors here. And if you are new with us today, we have visitor bags just for you. You can find those at the white welcome tent just past the fountain on your way out of worship this morning. And for everybody, you should see there are Connect Serve cards just in the chair pocket right in front of you. Feel free to fill one of those out if you have any questions or want to get on email lists or anything like that. And you can drop it in the offering boxes on your way out of worship in the lobby. And lastly, if you've been with us for a bit and you are looking to take a next step or come learn a little bit more about our church community, we'd love to have you in an upcoming new members class. So you can register for that at feumc.org slash new members. And the next class we have coming up is next Sunday, but then we have lots more classes happening after that as well. So we'd love the chance to get to see you then. And our kids in praise are going to kind of lead us in worship this morning. Are you all ready to play? All right.
Thank you, Kids and Praise, for leading us so well. Well, friends, a couple other things that might be helpful in the life of our church family. Hopefully you got a handout on your way into worship, and you can look at the front of that and the back of that for a lot of ways that you can connect with us in the coming weeks. Uh, The first of which is Come Learn Some More. That is going to be on Sunday, April 21st from 4.30 until 6. Uh, Pastor Owen and I will be hanging out at the hospitality patio, and we'll be making s'mores, so we'd love the chance to either get to make you a s'more or answer questions that you might have. Feel free to come drop by after you drop kids off for um, kids small groups or youth group or just um, come by the church. We'd love the chance to kind of answer any questions that you might have. And next, we are headed to The Scoop for kicking off the summer as a church. So this is a church-wide event. We would love the chance to get to see you at The Scoop. It's going to be on May 19th from 3 until 5 p.m., so feel free to drop in anytime. It would be a lot of fun to get to hang out with you there. And also kicking off on May 19th are our Forks and Fellowship groups. And this is a great place to get to meet other people in our church community. And it'll be a small group that we'll put you in that will go to dinner several times throughout the summer. And it's a great first step if you're looking to meet some other people um, but aren't necessarily ready to join a small group or Bible study or something like that. So info for that should be at the bottom of your handout, feumc.org slash forks24. We'll get you to that sign up that is already live. And next we have prayer workshops all throughout the sermon series. So The first prayer workshop is kicking off this Wednesday. It'll be Lectio Divina, led by Deb Murphy, Murphy, both this Wednesday and then also on Sunday morning from 9 to 10. I think Wednesday is from 7 to 8 p.m. So we'd love the chance to get to see you at any of those workshops. You will get to see all of the different ones online at fumc.org slash smallgroups24. And you can come to one of them. You can come to all of them. Totally up to you. And lastly, registration for VBS is open for volunteers. So if you are hoping to volunteer at VBS this summer and you want to register your kids, you get the the early bird special where you can go ahead and sign up to volunteer as well as sign your kids up for VBS. Uh, The dates are June 23rd through 27th, and we would love the chance to get to see you there. And we are going to um, stand as we prepare for our opening hymn this morning. Let's stand and worship our Lord together.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic, universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you are standing, please be seated. Good morning. My name is David Knox. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that, as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, Verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, David. Well, good morning again, friends. Uh, today we are kicking off a brand new sermon series all about the Lord's Prayer. And we'll be walking our way slowly through the Lord's Prayer for about the next eight weeks or so. And I realize this might be a prayer that is familiar to many of you. For some of you, it may be a brand new prayer. If you worship with us every week, then every time we prepare to come around the table for communion, we always share in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. So hopefully it's a familiar uh, prayer to you. I'm going to go ahead and have us put the words on the screen so we can be kind of reading over them, either familiarizing yourself if it is a new prayer or remembering them um, as we come to talk about the Lord's Prayer today. Um, before we kind of jump into the Lord's Prayer, I want to share a little bit about what this prayer has meant to me. Um, for me, the Lord's Prayer was the first prayer that I ever learned how to pray that had any kind of like length or substance. I don't know how you learn the Lord's Prayer, but for me, uh, my parents and I would kind of shift off every line or so. So I would pray a line, and then they would pray the next line, and then I would pray a line. And we did this until I felt like confident enough to be able to get through the whole prayer so that we could pray it together, or on Sunday mornings in church that I'd be able to pray it with the rest of the church community as well. Not only is this prayer often one of the first prayers that we learn, but it's often the last prayer on the lips of those that are dying. I regularly have the privilege of getting to visit church members who are in their last days, and every time I go for a visit, um, I always ask if we can conclude with prayer and pray the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Sometimes people are still alert enough to be able to kind of mouth the words of the Lord's Prayer. Others, though, are not able to kind of speak or articulate at all anymore, but I regularly see kind of folks relax as these familiar words of this prayer kind of wash over them. There are so many stories that I could share about the Lord's Prayer today, but there are two kind of instances that I want to start with that have kind of stood out to me. Uh, the first is less about a particular person and more about a phenomena that we regularly experience. And that is that a lot of folks that we visit even before their last days tend to struggle with memory. And for some, it's a battle with dementia or Alzheimer's. For others, there are kind of a number of contributing factors. Um, but I always am amazed when I have kind of been on a visit with somebody and we've had the same conversation again and again and again. And it just feels like kind of a, a circular conversation where the same question is asked and they give the same answer, same question, same answer. Um, and so it's been a little bit of a scattered conversation. And then at the end... I find myself asking, like, is it okay if we conclude with the Lord's Prayer? And this person that has struggled to carry on a conversation so perfectly zones in and nails every single word of the Lord's Prayer. It's clear to me in those moments uh, that the prayer has been a one that this person has rehearsed and remembered for so long throughout their lives that it is way in the depths of long-term memory, such that when there are many other things that they cannot remember— they still can get out the words of this familiar prayer. Um, my hope for myself is that even in my last days, that like them, I'll be able to say the Lord's Prayer even when nothing else kind of makes sense. Um, the second instance is December, happened on December 4th, 24th, sorry, December 24th, Christmas Eve of 2020. So I know not our favorite year to kind of look back on. It was a rough time. It happened in the back of our church on Christmas Eve, and we had 
prepared to serve communion to everybody in kind of a drive-through format. And we realized that it was going to be kind of a record-setting downpour happening that day. And so we put up massive tents in the back of the church. If you were with us in 2020, you might remember. And people kind of drove through, and at their car window, we served them communion. And before we um, went to serve everyone, the team that had gathered kind of prayed together and served one another before we went to serve everybody else. And I didn't realize how much I had missed hearing other people's voices in worship until this moment where we were preparing to serve one another, and whoever was leading that moment invited us to pray the Lord's Prayer. And that was the first time in like nine months that I had heard other people praying alongside me in worship. And it was just beautiful as these words kind of echoed um, these fam this familiar prayer. And I just found myself with tears streaming down my face as I had been longing and waiting for this moment uh, where not only would we be able to receive communion, but that we'd be able to worship together in some sort of format once again. It was a really holy and sacred moment. Um, prior to that moment, the last time that I had prayed that prayer in community had happened on March 13th of 2020 was kind of the waning hours before the COVID shutdown, and it was at Doris Green's funeral. Some of you might have remembered Doris. She was a member of our church community, and we had two funerals that week. So there was one on Wednesday, and hers was on Friday of that week. It was like the last thing that we did before we shut down. And about a week or so before that funeral, I had gathered with Doris and her family uh, to pray and to anoint her. And somewhere between the anointing and praying the Lord's Prayer together, we realized that Doris had taken her last breath. It was a really holy and sacred moment, to say the least, uh, to get to usher someone from this life to the next with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. It for sure is a moment that I will treasure for a long time to come. Certainly has not happened quite like that uh, since, and nor do I know if it will happen again quite like that, but it was a, truly a moment to be treasured. Hopefully, at this point, it is clear that this prayer is one that has been significant and transformative in my own life, and perhaps that also has been true for you as well. If it has not yet been, um, my hope is that by the end of the series, you will have either a new or a renewed appreciation, not just for the words of this prayer, but also for what God might do in us and through us as we pray and study these words over the next two months. If you've been with us the last like six or seven weeks through Lent, uh, you may know that we have been praying the words of another significant prayer in Scripture. Actually, David read a lot of the words of the Shema this morning. And this is a Jewish prayer that Jesus and his disciples would have prayed at least every morning and every evening. Oh, I think we still got the—do we have the Shema? Uh, the opening words of the Shema say, there we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus goes on to call these words the greatest commandment. And if you were with us on Monday, Thursday, you may remember that we talked about the new commandment that Jesus gave his disciples, kind of pulled from the words of Leviticus, to love one another as I have loved you. Other places in scripture, it's written to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this is what Jesus calls the second greatest commandment. So as we walk through the Lord's Prayer together, I'd encourage you to see it as an extension of the Shema, uh, because this prayer, in a sense, embodies these two things that Jesus calls the, second, the first and second greatest commandment, to love God and to love one another. Uh, the first half of the Lord's Prayer, or first, I guess, three lines, uh, all invite us more into the love of God. And the rest of the prayer invites us into loving our neighbors more deeply. Kind of both of these hold together kind of this greatest commandments that Jesus offers us. So my hope is that as we rehearse the words of the Lord's Prayer, uh, that they also help us to continue to live into the words of the Shema, to again pattern our lives after loving God with our full selves. The same way that we talked about with the Shema, um, prayer would have been a way of life for Jesus and his disciples not only would they have prayed the words of the Shema every morning and every evening, but prayer would have been something that they did for everything. There would have been a blessing and a prayer for nearly everything in their lives, and they would have learned these blessings or prayers from a very early age. So it does feel significant to me that when Jesus' disciples um, ask him 
this question. They are asking him how to pray because they would have already known so many prayers at that point. Like, it's not a new concept for them. But it also seems even more significant to me that Jesus actually gives them a really specific answer. We see in Luke chapter 11 this specific answer that he gives um, the disciples. It's set up by saying that he, or Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, whenever you pray, say, and then what follows are the words of the Lord's Prayer. I have to believe that the disciples saw something different in Jesus and how he prayed or how he understood prayer, or they would not have found themselves kind of asking this question. Perhaps they saw that Jesus understood prayer to be of utmost importance, and so they wanted to just make sure that they were doing it the right way. Perhaps they saw um, and recognized that prayer was the source of Jesus's power and that it also could be the source of their power. Maybe they heard Jesus praying to God, and they recognized something different in his prayers, that they wanted to learn how to replicate or emulate uh, that was different than how they had regularly been praying. I'm honestly not sure what it was that they heard that led them to ask this question. But my hope for us is that this question that they ask will be helpful for our own prayer lives, that they might be awakened or renewed as we pray these words of the Lord's Prayer. I've heard from so many of you that throughout the series we just finished up all kind of praying through the Shema and hearing stories and sermons from many of you in our congregation that that was really transformative for you, not only for your prayer life, but also for kind of the questions that you were asking about your own faith. And so I'm hopeful that this prayer will be a great kind of next step for us as we continue to be shaped and formed by prayer as a community. Earlier I mentioned uh, the Gospel of Luke where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. There also is a passage in Matthew where Jesus is teaching his disciples a whole lot about prayer. And then in the middle of all of his teachings on prayer is when he gives them the Lord's Prayer. Um, In this gospel, I'm struck by kind of a verse and a half that come right before the Lord's Prayer. It says, and this is Jesus's words, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. It's an interesting way to set up a prayer. The Father already knows your needs before you ask them, so therefore pray in this way. You certainly could read this verse as, well, God already knows what I need, so there's no sense in praying or asking. Another reading of this can be that God already knows what you need, and everything that we need can be found in this prayer. So therefore, pray in this way. Uh, Like many people, I grew up asking um, a lot of questions about prayer of, well, why should we pray? And what does it mean when we pray? Maybe you've had similar questions as well that are kind of echoed in this verse from Scripture. I knew that we didn't pray to inform God of things because, of course, God already knows all, so God doesn't need to be informed by us. Um, I knew that we didn't pray as if God was a holy vending machine, kind of putting in our requests to God for specific things, hoping uh, and ready to receive what God might spit out. I, I knew that that wasn't quite how it worked either. What I did know is that when we prayed uh, pretty regularly, uh, when we found ourselves in situations where we're scared or afraid or not sure where to turn, that we could always turn to God. In fact, I remember there are a lot of instances of when I would turn to God in prayer when I was scared or afraid. But the one that most comes to mind today is when my sister was first learning how to drive. So this was (laughs) when my sister and I played soccer growing up, and we were out at the SAS soccer fields, and everything had kind of cleared out for the afternoon. And I still, like, have questions as to why I needed to be a part of this moment. Like, I feel like my dad and sister could have done this on their own, or um, my sister and my mom, like, I didn't need to be a part of this. But here I found myself, and my dad and my sister were in the front seat, and our family friend Ramon and I were in the back seat. And it kind of started out by my sister, again, in the front seat, uh, is kind of looking at the gas pedal, looking at the brake, and she's like, Dad, do you think I can put red and green stickers on the gas and the brake to remember which one is which? Like, go-karts have that. Don't you think we should do that here? (laughs) So, To be clear, I had a reason to be anxious in this moment. That was one of them. Um, So she went to put the car in reverse, 
And I will never forget that Ramon, who is sitting next to me, just breaks out in the Lord's Prayer. He's like, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he just like keeps praying the Lord's Prayer again and again until my sister finally puts the car safely back in park. And Ramon jumps out of the car and kissed the ground and was like, I'm done. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> again, sometimes we find ourselves praying um, in general or maybe specific words in moments of fear or anxiety. <laughs> On a more serious note, though, I don't know that I could have named it then, um, but I look back at kind of my earliest memories of praying earnestly in high school, and my prayer life was shaped heavily by three specific tragedies that happened. Uh, The first was the death of a child in our congregation to a brain tumor. Uh, The second was a friend of mine in the youth group was paralyzed from the neck down on a mission trip that we were on together. And lastly, there was a miracle of a friend from school who survived a near-death experience due to liver failure, and she received a subsequent life-saving liver transplant. These experiences that I had at an early age, I learned firsthand kind of the power of prayer, and that prayer is about expressing our heart and our deepest longings to God. That prayer is about drawing near to God in our everyday lives. As I spent many restless nights with friends in our youth group kind of crying out to God in prayer, I learned that the words that we pray kind of shape us and form not only our hearts, but also our lives. I found many times throughout these experiences that sometimes we come to the end of our words, and there simply are no more words to pray. Sometimes familiar words like the Lord's Prayer just naturally seep out in these moments when we feel like we don't know what else to say to God. As a pastor now, uh, my hope is that these words of the Lord's Prayer can be kind of a trellis of sorts for each and every one of us. They can be words that teach us to pray daily and habitually, words that shape us, inform us, a prayer that trains us to offer our greatest hopes and our deepest fears to God. My hope is that the words of this prayer gives us words to say when we find ourselves coming up against the limits of what it is to be human, and again, we don't know what else to say or pray. Over the next eight weeks, we will be walking through this prayer, kind of line by line. My invitation to us is that we would rehearse the words of this prayer throughout the series. I'm going to make it my goal to pray this prayer three times a day throughout the series, and I certainly would encourage you to join me on this journey. There are lots of different ways that you could do this. Um, I'll offer kind of three ways that might work for you that you're welcome to kind of take on. Uh, The first is you could pray at three traditional times of day that the Lord's Prayer was prayed um, by early Christians. So this would be at 9 a.m., at 12 p.m., and at 3 p.m. If you go this route, my suggestion, I'm an alarms person. I will never remember something unless I have an alarm for it. So maybe you set an alarm every day for 9 a.m., 3 p.m., or 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. that reminds you to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer in that moment. A second, uh, maybe you choose to pray the Lord's Prayer as your blessing before every meal. So at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can pray the words of the Lord's Prayer as your blessing over your food. Or lastly, uh, maybe you just want to think about your own schedule. If these first two things don't really work for you um, and whatever you have going on on a daily basis, maybe you just want to think about what are three different things uh, or three different times throughout the day that would work best for you to pray. Uh, Maybe it's Every time you get in your car, you are going to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Or every time you let your dog out, you're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Like something that helps you remember that whenever you do this, you're then therefore going to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Every week during this series, we will be praying uh, this prayer. And today, in just a minute, we'll pray it at the close of our communion liturgy. Um, Before we pray it, though, I think it is helpful for us to remember why it is that we come around this table And when we come around this table, we come similar with a similar posture that we do to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, We come with a posture of ready to rehearse and to remember these familiar words, words that um, tie back to Scripture, words that Jesus has offered to each and every one of us. Uh, Before we come around this table, though, um, I invite us to confess our sin before God and one another, remembering that we worship a God of grace that always meets us in these places of confession. So let us confess together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. 
Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn as we sing together. Let us pray. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of a suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. Amen. The night in which Jesus offered himself up for us, he gathered around a table and he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you and he gave it to all of them saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we too offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith together. Let us sing. I'm going to invite you to open your hands in a posture of receiving as we continue to pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. It can be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at last at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, both now and forever. So let us sing. Friends, as we prepare to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer, I invite you to say these words recognizing them anew, I'm praying that as you say these words, that they might be words that shape and form not only your hearts, but also your lives. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I loved hearing the little voices around that were praying with us. 
Uh, well, as we prepare to come for communion, I'm going to go ahead and invite our communion servers and ushers forward, as well as our choir to go ahead and prepare to receive. If it is communion with us is new for you, you will be directed by the ushers and all are invited to come forward. So if you would like to come forward, feel free to follow the ushers direction and you will receive a piece of bread. You'll be invited to dip it into the cup of grape juice and you can receive both elements at the same time. And as, um, you come for it if you need either prepackaged communion or if you need gluten-free communion, then you're welcome to just tell the bread person we'll have a basket on our arms. So feel free to point to that and let us know if you need either of those options. And in the back, we have a gluten-free only station. So if you need to see an ingredient card or anything like that, feel free to head to the back and we'd be more than happy to serve you there. As the ushers come around, if you need to receive communion at your seat, just let them know. We'd be more than happy to serve you in that way. Friends, this is the table of our Lord, and all are invited to come and to feast together at this table. Let us come.
first John. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is John Clark. I'm the chair of the SPRC here at Fabumsi, uh, and I'm here with some updates about our pastoral transition, transitions <laughs> that are coming up. It's been a long morning, y'all. Sorry. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think it's important to kind of lay out the process just so you know. Our church is a part of the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Our bishop, Connie Sheldon, has been working, and she's responsible for placements of clergy within our conference, which runs from about Burlington to the coast. Yep. Um, we are in a district, and our district superintendent, Sonny Lim, has been working with us, the SBRC and the church, on these pastoral changes that are afoot. Uh, and so a couple weeks ago, we made the, the announcement that uh, Hope would be uh, going on to another appointment. We would be receiving a, a new appointed associate pastor uh, and said we would we'd give you some information once we had it. We've got the information, so I'm here today to, to share that with you. Uh, but first, we'll turn it over to Hope so she can tell you what she's got in store in her future. Perfect. Thank you, John. So I will actually be working at the conference office of the United Methodist Church, so kind of working with everyone from Burlington to the coast. And my title will be the Associate Director of New Faith Communities and Clergy Life for our conference. Uh, this is a brand new position that's designed to identify and equip individuals who are discerning calls to ministry with a particular emphasis on individuals um, identifying and equipping individuals that are BIPOC clergy and people who are excited about co-creating new spaces for new people. I'll be working with both the Office of Clergy Life as well as the Office of New Faith Communities to lead our conference in developing clergy that are called and equipped not only for the local church, but also for the future of the United Methodist Church in North Carolina. So I'm super excited about it, but also still super sad to leave as we have been talking about, um, but really grateful for your prayers in the midst of this transition. It is an incredible opportunity, uh, not only for Hope, uh, but also the conference. And uh, I know you can do a wonderful job at it, but um, it's okay to be sad. We, we, we live in this weird <laughs> world of transition where we want to be sad and happy at the same time. And we are incredibly sad uh, and uh, that Hope is moving to a new position, but we are incredibly excited uh, for what's in store. And um, Hope's going to be with us for a, for a bit longer. It's going to be with us till June. Uh, there are celebrations that are being planned, so don't worry. You've got plenty of time, and we're going to celebrate uh, all that Hope has meant to us uh, over these past five years and, and celebrate where she's going. So uh, stay tuned for that. The second part uh, of the announcement is we also uh, have been appointed a new associate pastor. Uh, pastor Melanie Sebastian Stafford will be joining us uh, as our associate pastor on July the 7th. Uh, currently, uh, Pastor Melanie is an associate pastor at First Ozark United Methodist Church in Alabama. Um, so she and her new husband are moving to North Carolina uh, about a week or two before she starts here in uh, July 7th. But um, 
Earlier this week, uh, Hope and Owen had a chance to record a Zoom call, because Alabama's not close, yeah. um, to, to talk with her a little bit, ask her a few questions, and thought you might like to uh, see what she has to say. So it's my honor and responsibility uh, to introduce you to Pastor Melanie. Thank you, John. Well, everybody, we're uh, so delighted to be joined by Melanie Sebastian Stafford today, uh, who is making plans to come and be uh, among us in ministry as one of our pastors. Uh, so, Melanie, welcome, <laughs> welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. I am so excited to join you all in ministry. Uh, my name is Melanie. I grew up in Northwest Florida, born in the Philippines, went to seminary at Candler in Atlanta. I'm currently living in Southeast Alabama. I'm really excited to make the move to North Carolina. Yeah, so you're in Alabama now and coming to Fuquay. Can you share a little bit about why North Carolina, why Fuquay? Yeah, so I recently got married. Like, I think it's 21 days now as of this recording. So um, my uh, my current husband um, is a former military person and a lot of his found family, people he served with, live in North Carolina now. And so uh, when we got married, we made a big compromise that um, I would search for an appointment in North Carolina, and his compromise was due to the appointment process anywhere in North Carolina. Um, and so we're really excited to end up in Kukwe. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I think as we're recording this next week is honeymoon week. Yes, Greece. Yeah, awesome. Live it up. Enjoy that. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, the old, you know, Alabama to Fuquay pipeline in full effect there. Uh, maybe last question. Uh, you're moving to North Carolina. On one side, we have mountains and on the other side, we have beach. What would your choice be between mountains and beach? What's your preference? Uh, that's a tough call. I do love a good hike, but the reason we're going to Greece is that both my husband and I love the beach. And so it was a place where we could both be happy. Um, so probably beach, but I haven't spent much time on North Carolina beaches. And that's much different than the Gulf I grew up on. So we'll see what it ends up being. Well, Melanie, uh, it's uh, been so much fun to get to know you over the last few weeks and all of the appointment process that we've been running through. But uh, we're really looking forward to having you here and among us. And uh, we know you'll be ready to hit the ground running. and safe travels on your trip, as well as moving your whole entire life uh, to North Carolina. But we're, we're excited Just to have Just a few you. transitions all at once. Just a few. Jobs, moving states, getting married. Just do it all at once. <laughs> do it all at once. It's Rip, it up. Yeah. Rip the old Band-Aid off, yeah. Good deal. Well, thanks for taking time, uh, and we'll see you in person real soon. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah. Well, I know you'll be anxious to get to meet Melanie when she arrives, but as we were just saying, she's got a lot of transitions ahead of her, so certainly please do be in prayer for her. Um, we are really excited for her, but also know that's a lot to do all at the same time. Uh, as we prepare to head out from here, I'm going to invite us to stand for our benediction. Friends, as we head out, may we go with the words of the Lord's Prayer on our hearts to be a people that let these words shape and transform us so not only our hearts but our very lives will be transformed by the way of Jesus. May you go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, friends. We'll see you next week.